So you want to be a real estate investor, but where do you start? How do you know what information and sources to trust? That's where I come in. I'm Johnny Catani, and this is the Investor Relations Real Estate Podcast. Hey guys, real quick, before we start, go to investwithkatani.com and download my free ebook, Is Commercial Real Estate Recession Proof? Now to today's show. What's up, guys, and welcome to another episode of the Investor Relations Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Johnny Catani, and I am joined today by Jesse Dickens. Jesse has a background in cardiac sonography and is currently the Director of Operations for a Mobile Imaging Center in Denver, Colorado. He got started in real estate in 2018 by getting involved with fix and flips. After successfully completing three flips, he decided to get into the multifamily space and join the Wheelbarrow Profits educational platform to learn the ins and outs of the industry. Since then, he has purchased 60 units between three acquisitions in Tucson, Arizona. The team has overexceeded expectations on those properties and continues to grow in their local partnerships and understanding of the market. With the teams and systems in place, the foundation is set for rapid growth in 2022. Jesse, welcome to the show. It's great to have you. Yeah, thanks for having me, Johnny. Yeah, we first connected at uh, Best Ever, which is obviously right in your backyard, and ironically, will be in my backyard next year. So, yeah, I'm bummed that it's that they're pulling it away from Colorado, but I'll have to come out and visit in Salt Lake. I'm a little bummed as well, for sure. I love a good excuse to leave, but um, yeah, it, uh, you know, having it in my backyard won't be terrible. So, uh, you know, you're pretty new in the space, I guess, relatively speaking, which is awesome. I love that uh, there's a another fellow person who's new. So let's kind of jump into it. You know, obviously your background is in uh, kind of the medical side of things. So what kind of got you into the fix and flips and, and you know, caught your eye for that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I really got bit by the real estate bug when my wife and I purchased our primary residence back in 2016. I just kind of fell in love with the entire process of getting an MLS search going and looking into different school districts and like looking at the market and, uh, and just kind of the excitement and the fear around that. And it just, it really caught my attention. Real estate was never on my radar prior to that. I had just finished up with my degree. I'd been in school for about 10 years and I uh, was just starting my career in the medical field and was really excited about that but then could not ignore this part of my brain that was saying, let's, let's tap into that and, and see what's going on. And shortly after that, like so many people that you're going to interview, I read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and it completely shifted the way that I looked at money, finances, and how that fit in with me and where that, um, where that sits and everything that I had learned around it so far. And I just, I got really angry that these were subjects that I had never heard about. Uh, and the idea of, you know, people that work hard for their money, and then, and then there's people that have their money work hard for them. And it just it just created this crazy mental shift that uh, that I couldn't ignore. And I started going down a path and, uh, and doing a bunch of research and diving into podcasts and, you know, and blogs and just reading every book I could about real estate, I, you know, I tapped into bigger pockets and, you uh, Really what happened for me was I got into a lot of analysis paralysis. And from for about a two to three year window, I wanted to, to I wanted to learn everything before ever taking any action. And I'd I'd hear from all these gurus about the upcoming crash that was surely to happen in the next quarter, you know, and uh, and I was like, oh, I don't wanna I don't wanna jump in right now. I just wanna get educated, I'll wait for the perfect time. And uh, and, and I realized that that's what was going on within me. And I, I knew that that was not a place that I could really make any kind of, I, I, until I actually took some action, I was just going to be stuck in that. I didn't know how to take that first step and get out of that fear and that analysis paralysis. So I had gone to a meetup. I, I met a gentleman that was doing some fix and flips, and I had the opportunity to partner up with him as more of a passive investor in a fix and flip. I was basically a, a private money lender to allow him to do his uh, for to allow him to go in and, and purchase this property, do his renovations and, and complete this flip. And we had talked about him kind of opening the door to what was going on behind the process uh, and allowing me to learn while I was doing that. And you know, after a couple of meetings with this gentleman, I felt comfortable with him and, 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 and trusting you know, that, 
that he was going to be a servant of, of my capital. And, uh, and I, I thought that was a way that I could get in and just get my feet moving and create some momentum. So we, we did that. It went well. We repeated the process. It went well again. I decided to step out and do a flip on my own and, uh, and, and went through one of those. I purchased a home in uh, December of 2019. So probably about a week before I ever heard the phrase COVID-19 <laughs> and, uh, and went through uh, what was definitely a scary process, thinking that the market was going to crash, thinking that the world was going to come to an end, thinking that I had just lost all of my family's uh, earnings and that you know I made a, a, a huge mistake. Obviously, uh, what we thought was going to happen in the real estate market, or at least what I thought was going to happen, did not take place and we did fine on it. But in that process, I, I, I realized that flipping was just another transactional thing. It was something that you can do. And if you do it right, you can make a nice little chunk of money. And then that money is just going to look for the next home. And I knew that I'd, I'd really kind of identified the difference between earning capital in real estate and building generational wealth. And the people that had rentals really had that generational wealth. Uh, that's, that that's where that came from. And uh, I assumed that multifamily was kind of the end stage for the, the, uh, the investor that had been investing for 10 plus years. And, and you finally get in, you learn the secret handshake and you get in with other investors and are able to, to do big deals. And, uh, and I got some guidance from another gentleman. I met another gentleman, gentleman I met at a meetup. And he said, it doesn't necessarily have to be like that. And he pointed me in the direction of, uh, of some, uh, some educational groups that I should look at. So I went through my due diligence period. Uh, I did a lot of interviews and I, I ended up joining the group. Jake and Gina was the group that I joined and, uh, and got started with the process of learning about multifamily investing and all the ins and outs of it and, uh, and, and really where to get started. And since that time, that was uh, early 2020. And since that time, I've been able to get in with a group that we are focused. I, I live in Denver, Colorado, but uh, we are primarily focused on Arizona. Uh, Tucson specifically, and we purchased three multifamily properties, all in the eight to 28 unit range. So we have three properties totaling 60 units and, uh, and looking to, to grow and scale from there. So that's kind of a brief overview of, uh, or a synopsis of, of the journey so far. That's awesome. I love it. And that's such a, um, like a, a classic story, right? And of course, as you mentioned, you know, there is money in the fix and flip game, but it's just not scalable. And once you get to the point where you realize that it's not at the scale that you truly want, that enter commercial real estate, right? Enter large multifamily, whatever you want to call it. And it really is just, it opens your eyes and you realize what is actually possible in terms of, you know, scalability and profits and cash flow and different things like that. And, you know, raising capital and all these different things and it, you know obviously a different game but you know uh a lot you know more fun in my in my personal opinion you know but um that's that's really a great story so what i guess it, it sounds like you did you chose you know you did your vetting process to choose which mentorship you wanted to but at, at that point were you like no i'm going straight to the source like i want to join a group and really expedite my learning process as opposed to what you had done before, where you just like kept kind of turning your wheels over podcasts and books. Yeah. I mean, I, I realized that for me, going the DIY process of gaining information and also not everything that you hear on a podcast, not everything you read in a book, not everything you read on the internet is going to be the right kind of information for you. So to have to go through all that process on my own and filter what works and what doesn't work for me and not have the level of accountability. I, I realized how much I had spun my wheels by doing that. And it took me so long to actually jump in and, and take some action on my own. Uh, and, you know, I think that everything happens for a reason, but I also knew that I, I just didn't want to go through that process again with a different asset class and, and getting into multifamily. And I really wanted, so the, the education piece and understanding how these things work and it, in learning modules and all this kind of stuff and learning how to, you know, build broker relationships. That's all great. And I needed all that, 
But really the piece for me that was that, that really moved the needle was having the accountability of having other people that were in the same boat as me and having, you know, having coaches, that's, that's great. But having people that I could team up with and talk about the struggles that we're having, the wins, you know, getting on a, you know, group calls and just kind of finding out where other people are at and finding people that have different kind of skill sets and finding where you fit into a team. Uh, I think that was, that was really the big thing for me. And I knew that from the start, that that was kind of the draw of any of these successful groups. There's a lot of successful groups out there uh, and they might look a little bit different uh, on the, on the surface. They might have different personalities, but really what creates that, that environment for success with their students comes from creating a culture of accountability. And, and that's what I was drawn to. And that's, that's what I found with the group that I joined. Absolutely. And what a difference that makes too. when like-minded they're holding you accountable and not in a sense of like, you know, putting you down if you don't hit the goal that you wanted to reach. But, you know, this is what I love so much about this space is everybody just wants to help everybody. And really one thing that I kind of pinpointed to is that there aren't any secrets in this industry anymore, right? Like this investing in real estate has been a thing for, you know, for as far as you can go back in terms of, you know, since we've been able to sort of, you know, quantify real estate. And so we're, nobody's reinventing the wheel. So nobody has a secret or, you know, a, a loophole that, you know, they're, they're withholding because there really aren't any anymore. So everybody wants to help everybody. And it's really awesome to be able to join a group. And I can only imagine that, you know, as soon as you join your knowledge and everything just expedited because that's exactly what happened to me when I joined Raise Masters. So let's kind of go through it now. You've done three deals now. Kind of talk about your first deal. Why, why uh, Arizona? And, uh, you know, kind of talk about your first deal. Sure. So uh, I teamed up with a group of investors that were all very drawn to uh, to Tucson, Arizona. And the reasons for that was obviously with this migration shift that we've been experiencing within the country, and this goes to pre-COVID, COVID just really expedited that process. But when you look at the net migration numbers, even prior to 2019, so many people are, there are just states that, you know, a lot of people are drawn to the Southeast, Florida, Georgia, Tennessee, uh, and on, you know, a little bit farther West, like along the Sun Belt of Texas and Arizona, there's just, the net migration patterns are, they're, they're proven. And so we were drawn to it even prior to COVID, uh, the employment growth there, the major employers that are moving to those markets. So that's the kind of stuff that we want, that we watch. I love the fact that it's a secondary market. Obviously uh, living in Phoenix has become a very expensive place uh, to live. It's become unaffordable for a lot of people that grew up there are now not able to purchase a home as we're moving into this hybrid work from home kind of model, which seems to be the case moving forward. A lot, of, a lot of companies are not moving back to the office. When you can live in a city like Tucson, which is about an hour and a half from Phoenix, and live there for about 50 to 60 cents on the dollar for the cost of living, there's just, we just see the runway for a market like that carrying out for an extended period of time. So all the metrics that we're looking for uh, for continued growth, obviously looking at the past growth that they've had, you know, we were looking at, you know, I think it was five to 7% rent growth year over year for the past three years prior to 2019. We were really excited about that. And then the past couple of years, I mean, last year we had 15 to 20% rent growth. And obviously that's not something that you project moving forward. That's not something that you would put in your underwriting. You, you know, I don't think investors would ever want to see that you're looking at that kind of projection but we believe that there's still a good runway in the supply and demand issue, like all the factors that are, you know, really affecting the country as a whole. There are certain pockets of the country that are really pushing, uh, pushing that even more. And we feel that the market that we're playing in has all those factors. So that's why we were drawn to it. Uh, it, it was tough kind of building the rapport with brokers. I don't know what your experience has been with that, but coming in as an investor that doesn't have any assets under their belt, you call up brokers and you, you try to build a relationship and, you know, they might be cordial on the phone, but really like you're not going to get any kind of spe uh, preferential treatment 
Yeah, the, you know how many calls we're getting from newer investors that really want to get into multifamily and have this criteria. So we weren't get, you know, we were just seeing stuff that was on market, it didn't pencil out, it wasn't even close to penciling out. So we took an off-market approach and we started sending out direct mail. Uh, we started cold calling, and that's how we found our first deal. We found a 24-unit property from a mom and pop owner that had owned it for I think it was about 11 years, severely under market rent, a uh, decent amount of deferred maintenance. He just, he never wanted, he had a bad experience with a broker years ago and told himself he would never do another deal with a broker. So he was looking for an off-market transaction and we created a win-win situation uh, where we were able to get in. We knew we had a good amount of meat on the bone. The What he was looking for in his price, it, it, it just, it made sense. And we were able to not have a bidding war on it. So that's how we, we found, uh, how we found the deal. We were able to close on it with agency debt. It was hundred percent occupied. So we got really good safe debt on it, 10 year fixed rate debt. Uh, so we didn't have to do kind of a, a refi on it. And at the time we were concerned about, you know, where, what's going to happen in the world uh, and where things are going to be at in another 12, 24 months. So we really didn't want to be forced into a refi. So we, we just put safe debt on it. Uh, and now that kind of limits our, our exit strategy because we have a prepayment penalty if we were to exit or refi on it. But uh, the deal uh, has has completely outperformed what we were expecting. I mean, we were the numbers we were looking at for our income in years five and six, we were hitting by the end of year one. So we're, we're pretty excited. I mean, we have a lot of options now on it and we've gone through all the deferred maintenance. We've kind of, we've, we've stabilized it. It didn't need a lot of stabilization, but uh, that's what we're looking for, light to medium value add. Uh, we weren't really looking to get into a, a super heavy project right off the bat. We didn't want to bring in investors right off the bat on the first deal. We wanted to put this to the test and get this kind of proof of concept with our own capital. So we just did a joint venture on it. And we, you know, our second deal was a, a smaller deal, actually, that we got through through a broker. And uh, it was just an eight-unit deal. And we saw this as a, a pretty, pretty quick um you know, rip off and duplicate kind of process. So we're actually looking at, we'll probably be uh, looking to exit that here in the next six months or so. Uh, and essentially just do a, a flip on a on an apartment complex. And we weren't really planning on doing that quick of an exit, but with the way the market has been and it doesn't align with our long-term goals, you know, we'll probably just take that and tend to one something larger. And then about two months ago, we closed on a 28 unit down there with the same broker. And now we've kind of solidified that broker relationship and, uh, and are excited. And that one is a little bit more of a heavy lift. And now we feel a little bit more prepared to handle that kind of property. And this was the first syndication that we did. So uh, it, it, uh, it checked a lot of boxes for us. Awesome. I love that. So going back to the first one, then didn't bring in any outside capital. You said joint venture, did it yourself. Second one, second one, you're about to exit, right? The eight unit you're about to exit makes total sense. Obviously for your ultimate goal, eight units, probably not, you know, listen, it was there. It was a good deal. Really got you your foot in the door with the broker, which is really ultimately, you know, where that that's really going to going to pay off because I actually just had a broker on and, and ultimately what it comes down to with a broker relationship is can they get the deal done? And now they know you can, and you're, you know, a team of your word, meaning you're going to do something, you say you're going to do something, you're going to do it. And so now you have that relationship. So with the first one, you said you have the agency dead style. The second one sounds like you kind of learned your lesson. So the exit's going to be pretty smooth then. Yeah. So we, we have a relationship with a community bank down there that has, they're difficult to work with. I'll say that, but they have unbelievable terms that we can't, we, we really have, it's almost like a hybrid. They're, they're offering us two years of IO, a sub four rate, a five-year term, no prepayment penalty. So we can basically use that as bridge debt without having it really be, we don't have a 24 month window where we have a balloon. We've got a five-year term. We could extend it to a seven-year or a 10-year, uh, and we can get some I.O. on it to really stabilize it. The only difference is we are, it is a recourse loan. So we don't, that's, that would be the difference between us being able to, uh, to take it to a true bridge debt would have, it would be non-recourse. So that's the one downside on it, but it just allows us so much flexibility 
where we thought this was going to be a two to three year hold. And now this is really a, a 12 month hold and then, and, and we're out. Um, and we we're we're going to exceed our numbers even within that, that small time period. But yeah, we, we, I think that was the ultimate lesson that we learned from the first one was that the debt, we, we knew that we were taking the safe route. And now looking back on it retrospectively, if we had more flexible debt, we would, I mean, we would just refi all of our initial capital out at this point, you know, less than 18 months into a deal and, and be able to just repeat that process. So that's, uh, I, I think, especially where we're at in the market cycle, and everyone's going to have different opinions on where we're at, what the future holds. But I think there's, everyone can agree that we're just in really uncharted territory right now. And that there's, there's just so many different ways that this thing could go. Uh, so being able to have that flexibility and being able to develop relationships with community lenders that understand the market and are willing to be a little bit more flexible, knowing that their business is going to come from investors that want and need that flexibility and not to feel handcuffed in a deal to where they can't exit or they're forced to exit. So that's, uh, that's, you know, this is, it's, it's great. Every, every experience that we have, every property that we had, has been a learning experience, whether it be good or bad. And, uh, and, you know, I think you probably learn more from your mistakes and, and we feel very fortunate that we haven't had any, any catastrophic mistakes that have cost us, you know, we've, when we, we've been able to do well, but you typically learn, learn better from those, from those kind of challenges. Absolutely. And now you'll have an exit under your belt, which as you go out and continue to grow and obviously, you know, acquire larger, larger properties and do bigger deals. Now you have that exit under your belt that you can show to uh, potential investors, which looks really good. So along those lines now, you know, like you said, you're going to exit this, you're going to take it in and, and, you know, find bigger deals. So you know, as we mentioned in, in your intro, you've kind of set the foundation. So now talk about what your guys' goals are moving forward and, and you know, for this year and, and continuing forward. Yeah, so it's all about scalability right now. So we've kind of cut our teeth with these small to mid-sized properties. It's been great, but we're also realizing the inefficiencies in that space. And having one property manager now have three different properties that are all relatively close geographically, but they're spread out. And just the challenges of not having full-time maintenance there, not having full-time leasing there. And just, there's just a level of inefficiencies that you're going to, even if you have a, a good relationship with your property manager, even if things are running smooth, there are still inefficiencies that you're not going to be able to conquer when comparing that to, you know, getting into the 60, 80, 100 unit plus where you do have that full-time staff that's there and truly have eyes on the property at all times. So we would love to, we still love the value add play, looking at B and C class. We're not opposed to looking at some A class stuff, but we just, again, see more of a runway in the B and C class. And just with the fact that the properties that we're buying, you, it's impossible to build right now for less than what our acquisition cost is. So, um, so it just, we know that the amount of inventory is going to, the constraints there aren't going anywhere and the demand isn't going anywhere. So that's the space that we want to continue to play in, but we want to get into, you know, we've kind of changed our parameters around what our minimum purchase price is, as well as our minimum doors moving forward. So we're just trying, we're trying to grow and scale and look for, a, you know, additional team members that are, that are, that, you know, have the same kind of beliefs and, uh, and strategies and, uh, in, in kind of the same end goals and, and just trying to trying to partner up with people that are that are looking to do the same thing. Absolutely. Make, makes perfect sense. I love that a lot. So now, you know, kind of back up a little bit here to go forward. So third deal was actually a real syndication or a full syndication. So you brought in, you know, outside investors kind of talk about, you know, your sounds like that was your first official capital raise. So kind of talk about that process, what that was like for you and, you know, was it just friends and family or did you have to go out and, and, you know, kind of go beyond that? Yeah. So we did a 506 B. So it was a, a friends and family kind of raise. Our team is, is five individuals, five parties. There's a couple of couples in there, uh, but it's five, five uh, groups in our general partnership. So the total raise for us, we were shooting for 1.1. We had a total capital to close was 1.35 
and, and our team collectively brought about 250 to that because our belief is we want to invest in every single deal that our investors are investing in. We want to we want to show complete transparency and say, hey, we have skin in the game and we always will. We're never going to put your capital at risk if ours is not at risk as well. So we we're shooting for 1.1. We ended up over subscribing on it. So we ended up shaking off a little bit of what we were putting in to allow the last couple of investors to come in. So we the total raids ended up being 1.2. Uh, we're fully capitalized and it was, I'll just say it was a wide range of emotions. So <laughs> when we, when we got the, when we got the call from the broker that, you know, we landed the deal, total excitement and jubilation. And we had, we had set it for 50 days to close the deal. So, you know, we had, I'd say the first 48 hours after closing was just pure excitement around it. it was, oh my God, this is, this is the deal that we've been looking for. This is really going to help us take the next step. And then the next 48 days was, oh my God, what did we get into? We, you know, it's, it's just funny how, uh, how, you know, I think so much of what we're doing and just kind of business in general is the mental hurdles that we face and like true entrepreneurship. That's, that's really where the rubber meets the road because you can learn all the logistics of something or the, the mechanisms of how something works. But when you have to battle yourself and your own intuition, and, you know, I think we have these natural kind of safeguards or protectors saying, Hey, like this could be risky. Let's not do this. And you have these thoughts of, I have no idea what I'm doing. Like I, we, we shouldn't be doing this. We shouldn't be, we shouldn't be buying properties. And I don't live, I live at a state. Like it doesn't make sense. Uh, and it's funny how those, those thoughts happen almost automatic for me, at least in my experience, and you have to really push through that and quiet that stuff. And, and again, like going back to the accountability and having people in your corner that have gone through that and experienced that and have walked through it. And, you know, we, on our first deal, we had some stuff come up in the inspection that we weren't, that we weren't, we didn't think was going to be there. And we had to go back and negotiate a little bit and we were able to get enough of a seller credit to stay, but we had basically set a line and said, Hey, if we can't get this seller credit, we're going to have to walk and we're gonna have to step away from this. And now when we look back on it, we, we had that line and we were able to meet that line and, and close the deal. But if we didn't, and we walked away, we would have walked away from a deal that is, I mean, that deal is, is really going to set the tone for the trajectory of our real estate investing careers. So it's, it's funny how in the moment, it's so hard to take a step back and take a, a truly objective view of it. So uh, going through the first raids and all the hurdles and dealing with syn a syndication attorney, our lender, I had mentioned that it was a little bit difficult working with them. They had not completed a syndication. Our specific loan originator had not gone through that process. So they were throwing us some curveballs and it was just kind of one thing after another and we were concerned if we were going to be able to open up our portal to start accepting funds and be able to open up our bank account in time to to to, to meet the closing table and our the seller was doing a 1031 so he had a very strict timeline that he needed to he needed he, he needed us to execute you know and the broker had had pushed our deal forward because he said just like you said you know you were able to close a deal so they can relay that to the seller uh and and we were able to to perform on it and it was a lot of a lot of nights where I didn't sleep very well, you know, and, uh, and I think that's just kind of part of the process of, of cutting your teeth with it and, and and having those tough nights and just laying there in bed and being physically exhausted, but your heart is still racing and you're just, you're just thinking about everything that could potentially go wrong. And at this point, now you've become you have a fiduciary responsibility to your investors. I mean, your investors are your friends and family and your coworkers and people that are going to be you know, having Thanksgiving dinner with you, it just changes, it just changes the game. And I think it's really, it's actually great because I think that they know that we're going to fight for them as we're going to do everything we can to, to under promise and over deliver on our deals, you know, because we don't want to ever sour that relationship. And no one talks about that in the beginning when you are just raising from your friends and family, how these are literally your friends and family, right? Like this is your network, like your tightest people. And certainly, you know, that also goes the other way because then, you know, 
they still love you in the end, hopefully. But like, that's more pressure, you know. That's like, like the the people who give the most speeches will always tell you, I'd rather go up in front of ten thousand strangers than my ten closest people, you know, to give a talk. And it, it's the exact same thing. So, and it sounds like you had literally every variable, you know, a lender who had never done it before, and you know, everything is being thrown your way, and you know, but finally you can say like, okay, we overcame every hurdle got the deal done and now it's through the door and how long ago was that that was just two, closed two months ago you said right yeah we closed february 8th. awesome so you guys are on to your uh your capex and and starting that that whole process oh yeah huge projects right off the bat so and you said now, this one was a heavier was, lift yeah so we had we had big time deferred maintenance we had roofs that were that were pretty leaky that we knew about going into it and you know water damage because of that so you know, all new roofs, uh, the landings on the second floor of the walkways because of that water damage had really some some soft spots that were starting to kind of poke through. And, uh, you know, just the liability that's on your hand, if someone falls through that, you know, now that's your problem. So those were the two main issues, basically safety issues that we had to take, take care of right off the bat. And now it's more of the cosmetic stuff. You know, we're going to clean up the pool area, we're going to probably put like a little gazebo there and make it more family oriented. We're going to repaint the property. We're going to rename the property, completely rebrand it. You know, we're going to be attracting a different tenant base. Uh, and so there's, there's just bumps that are going to be on that road when you're basically, there's a portion of your tenant base, your residents that, you know, aren't going to be able to support. So it's tough because it really pulls on kind of the the heartstrings a little bit and the human element of hey this is someone's home this is a family's home so like we want to it's it really important for us to have that conversation with our property manager of how to approach this and how can we bring someone up to market rent over the course of time we don't we don't look at every every resident the same you know and obviously you have to follow fair housing rules and everything like that but you know we the last thing that we're trying to do is put a family out on the street and be the landlord that comes in because i've lived in apartment complexes where you know new ownership there's signs that go up new ownership and then on the next lease renewal no changes to the apartment it's just hey your rent is you know going up 30 percent from what it was because you were under market rent and it, you know i think we've had collective talks as a group and said we're not, we're not trying to be that person. You know, we're trying to be someone that's going to, our, our idea is add value first, go fix the issues, you know, make this a more comfortable, make this truly a home for these residents and then, and show them that, you know, this, you know, we're going to put some TLC in areas that have clearly been neglected for an extended period of time. And, you know, the previous seller left, a, left us plenty of areas to do that. Absolutely. Are you finding that some of the tenants are actually because you are improving the living situation so well that they are willing to stay and, and take on that additional the increase in rent? We haven't even started raising rents yet. We okay. wanted to get through a certain level. Basically, the first quarter for us is really like that first block of stabilization. Fix the, the serious deferred maintenance that's causing safety issues, then start to get to more of the aesthetic stuff. And then we can look at renewals. And a lot of people are month to month there. So that's really great. We like that. About 50% is month to month because then we really have flexibility and say, hey, we want to, you know, we don't want people to be month to month moving forward. We really want to put people on 12 month leases and we can decide how aggressive we want to be and see kind of where that sweet spot is uh, when we start to go through and push. But the whole, the whole idea is start from the outside in and create a different we want to create, we want the look of the property to, to be different, but really fixing the big exterior issues. And then we move in and we're, and you know, any, any turn that comes up, if a, if a tenant moves out, you know, we'll, we'll turn that and then just put it up at market rent, do our, our normal, normal turn on it. But with in place tenants, we want to really show them, we want to, sh want to we want them to see that first. And that, but so we haven't, we haven't even gotten there yet. So I'll have to report back to you on, on how that process is going. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. That's, that's so awesome. And that's really such a great, and I'm such a huge proponent of the rebrand, especially with such a heavy lift, you know, it really just kind of gives it just 
it's like brand new, you know, it's like you just built a whole new place, you know, you paint it, you redo the inside, the roof's new. It's like, you know what, we need a whole new name here. And, yeah. and uh, that's awesome. So listen, I wish we could keep going because of course, you know, you and I could talk about this forever, but we are nearing the end. So we are getting to the final five questions that I ask all the guests. So the first one, and I'm really excited for your answer on this one is uh, best advice you've gotten from a mentor. The best advice that I've gotten would probably be along the lines of the, the mental stuff that I was talking about. And uh, I had someone tell me that the virtue lies in the struggle, not in prize. So basically fall in love with the process, not the results. So everyone wants the results. You see people, you go on social media, you see people closing deals, leaving their W-2s, doing all this stuff, traveling, like living this lavish life, you know, and you see that in a lot, for a lot of people, that is the end goal. But what people don't see is getting up at 4.30 in the morning, going to bed at 11.30 at night, just being on the grind and falling in love with that process. So when my shift, when my focus started to shift away from, hey, this is there, and there's nothing wrong with having goals and, and having targets to hit, but it's really about finding your process and finding your systems that will allow you to get there and finding people that will keep you in line with that. So that would be my probably my biggest advice to someone getting started is to fall in love with the process and not necessarily the results. Yeah. And and once you really get into this and, and you become a true entrepreneur, you realize it's not really about the goal, it's about the system that you put in place. That's, Mm -hmm. you know, you read Atomic Habits, that's the, that's a big thing in Atomic Habits, right? Sure. Yes, of course, we want to change little things. And goals are important. Don't get me wrong. I have, you know, one month, I have five year goals, right? But ultimately, in order to reach that, it's really about the system I'm putting in place in that five years. Awesome. So love that. Second, what is it about what you're doing your career that makes you feel like you're fulfilling your why? Hmm. Getting to see the transformation in these properties, uh, I think, like we were just talking about, getting to see the physical change and really bringing a property to life, just in how it it looks when you drive by it, is really awesome. But the deeper part is when you're able to get feedback from your residents about the changes that you're making and making, like literally making the property a safer place to be. When you're dealing with C-class assets, especially, there's there's going to be some, some challenges with it. And we face those right off the bat within, within two weeks of our first acquisition, we had a death on the property and a stabbing on the property. They were next door neighbors and they were completely unrelated, but we wow. kind of looked at each other and said, what did we, what did we get ourselves into? And we have the ability to come into some of these communities and really provide attention that's been neglected for so long and create a different environment for families. And that is, you know, obviously you want the the numbers on the spreadsheet to make sense and you want to be hitting your returns. But when you, when you have that at the forefront of what you're trying to do, and when you get to see that actually coming to life and hearing that from the residents, it's just a special feeling. And I think that's kind of what keeps you going for me at least, in all those tough times when you wonder, like, why am I doing all this? Is this really fulfilling my why? But then you have experiences like that. And it says, it says to you, yeah, like you're, what you're doing is making a difference. So. Love that. That's so awesome. That's incredible. Yeah. Wow. You guys, three deals and you've literally almost experienced everything. So you're, you're going to be well seasoned. Yeah. I've only done three deals, but I have 10 years of experience. <laughs> Look, I look like an old guy because I've, I've gone through a lot of these, okay? I love it. What's your favorite non-real estate or investment-related book? Uh, I'd say The Go-Giver. I don't know if you've read that, but it is, again, just back to a mindset kind of, uh, it, the, the mindset approach. And, and really, it talks about the differences between, look, there's a lot of go-getters out there. There's a lot of people that are willing to put in the grind, be, you know, just be hustlers and go out there and, and do everything. But really the people that are successful, the people that I look up to take the go-giver mindset. And they say, I'm going to go out and I'm going to provide value expecting nothing in return. 
that's going to be my main focus. So the people that really focus on that, in turn, those are the people that really attract the kind of the kind of people in their life that are going to make those those differences, you know. And by you starting the podcast and putting this information out there for anyone that that's willing to listen to it, that's taking a step in that direction. And I love it. And I'm really excited to see where this thing goes for you. And I would right. highly recommend for uh, for anyone listening to go check that book out. Awesome. Yeah, it's such a great book. And we'll link it in the show notes as well. Awesome. Uh, next question. If you could have any superpower, what would it be? <laughs> uh, superpower. You know, it's uh, it's funny because you learn a lot of your, your strengths and weaknesses in this process. And uh, underwriting for me was something that I was really drawn to in the beginning. And I love the idea of being able to sit down and just analyze deal after deal after deal. And I've realized over the past probably two years that underwriting is just not, it's not my superpower. It's not my strength. And it's really not something that I truly enjoy. Like I'm more of a relationship, get out there, tour the property, build the relationships, do all that kind of stuff. And so the way that we, you know, you, you find, like I said, you find your strengths and weaknesses. If I had a superpower, I wish I could be just that master underwriter and be able to analyze the deal in 10 minutes and say, and give a broker some info, uh, some feedback on it and say, yay or nay, we'll, we'll, we'll take a deeper dive on this. So it's something that I've realized I'm really not great at. And it's okay because I'm not going to work on that weakness. I'm going to focus on the strengths that I have and really build those and then get together with some master underwriters and, and put a team together. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's all about just knowing your superpower and then teaming up with the people who complement it. Cool. And last one, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you and reach out if they want to learn more? Yeah. So I'd say you can just reach out uh, either by myself. I'll just give my cell number here, 720. 720- Two two nine nine eight nine nine, or you can email me at jesse dot dickens two eight one five at gmail dot com. Uh, jesse is not spelled with an I, by the way. And uh, I'd I'd love to connect. I mean, I just love talking real estate. Uh, if anyone has any questions or, or whatever, I, I'm always happy to chat about it. Sweet. We will link all that in the show notes. Jesse, thank you so much. This has been incredible. I've seriously enjoyed it so much. Johnny, appreciate it, man. Excited to see this thing uh, really take off for you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Hey, guys. Thank you so much for watching today's episode. I hope you really enjoyed it. Listen, I know it's cliche and you hear it all the time, but please don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel so you know when the next video is coming out. Even though this is technically a daily podcast, you know it's coming out the next day. Uh, we have a ton of content coming your way, so please like and subscribe. It helps a ton. Leave comments. We'd love to know what you guys think, and uh, we will see you on the next one. Thanks so much.